Welcome to the pro third session on protocols. And uh, the next talk will be Asymmetric PEG with Low Computation and Communication by Bruno Freitas dos Santos, Yanki Gu, Stanislav Szereki, and Hugo Kravchik. And uh, Stanislav is giving the talk. Is my mic on? Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, OK, thank you for the introduction. Um, OK, so uh, let's start with what uh, PAKE is. Uh, PAKE is, uh, uh, hold on. Is there a pointer here? Ah, OK. Um, well, <laughs> PAKE is a functionality where uh, two parties put passwords and the functionality checks if the passwords are the same. If they are, it gives them a fresh random key. If they are not, it gives them independent keys. Uh, so it's used for authentication and key establishment at the same time. And uh, the most efficient takes in the random oracle model are, uh, they all come from blinding Diffie-Hellman key exchange using uh, passwords. And it starts with encrypted key exchange by uh, uh, that often a merit and uh, continues by uh, the first result uses ideal cipher, then random oracle onto the group, not onto the group, uh, you know, and, and, and then the costs were optimized. But they are basically roughly like a key exchange. Um, now, uh, what we do in this paper is an asymmetric peg. Um, what is that? So now the server no longer puts a password into the protocol. He has a deterministic one-way hash function of the password. And uh, the functionality checks whether the client's input and the server's input are related through this one-way function. Uh, why? So that when a server is compromised at some point uh, and presumably has a database of uh, user accounts and these password hashes, uh, the password doesn't go in the clear, I, I, you have to do a brute force search uh, to find the pre-image of this uh, deterministic hash. That's the problem we address here. Uh, there is a strengthened version of this, uh, of this model where we call strong asymmetric peg, where the server's hash is randomized. The randomization is commonly referred to as salt in the hash, and uh, the key, and now the functionality checks is randomized hash, right? Uh, the key thing is that the uh, salt is private to the server, uh, does not leave the server. And uh, why is that beneficial? Because the brute force attack cannot be pre-computed uh, before a server is compromised. Uh, these uh, asymmetric pages that we address can be salted but the salt is uh, by necessity public. Uh, it can be derived from client's name, server's name. It can be derived from some random nonce that the server stores, but the random nonce has to be known, the, sent to the client in some form uh, because hash function is assumed to be computable by the client. Uh, uh, and for completeness, because we will use this tool, uh, let's compare it to an authenticated key exchange where the two parties have, there is a, they have private public keys. The public keys are like a common reference string uh, under which they execute. And if one party sub, you know, supplies their private key and the other uh, there, then uh, the keys are established, right? So that's the, that's the public key uh, uh, counterpart uh, authenticated key exchange. So, uh, what is known efficiency-wise about these things, uh, about password authentication? Uh, so uh, let's first look at uh, just symmetric PEG, right? So encrypted key exchange, uh, PAC, SPEG, uh, other variants, they basically get a cost of uh, unauthenticated Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Moreover, they have sort of perfect communication pattern. It's a unanimous single flow. Uh, the, just like in a key exchange, Diffie-Hellman, I can send G to the X, you can send G to the Y. Maybe you sent your G to the Y yesterday. Maybe I, you know, right? Like we can do this asynchronously. And then when I get your message, I compute the key. And so the same for you. And these uh, symmetric pegs have this property as well. 
Uh, now, if you want explicit authentication, then uh, you have to do three rounds. Uh, so that's optimal too. Uh, now, what about the APEC cost? So first, uh, Jutla and Roy had a, actually a unanimous, uh, so minimal communication uh, protocol, but it used by linear maps, uh, type three curve, so it was significantly more expensive. Now, uh, there are compilers uh, that given a peg with signature by uh, Gentry et al, uh, give you a key, uh, uh, this authenticated, uh, this asymmetric peg. Uh, and then uh, Schub had a specialized result for a version of S peg that, that supports asymmetric uh, setting. Uh, uh, and, uh, and these compilers were, uh, these settings were in a, a non, uh, well, so first they don't have salt. And I have a little bit of a start there. So uh, what is the double star for the no salt? Well, if whenever you have a APEC that doesn't have a salt, you know, you can always add salt. The server sends salt, at which point the non-salted version can run, but you add, add two flows. The client has to say, hey, what's the salt? The server has to say, here's the salt, and then they run the previous protocols, right? So from three rounds, you get five rounds. Um, in the last crypto, uh, we have um, we had uh, this protocol CAPE that gets the cost down to an authenticated key exchange. So somehow you get the cost of this asymmetric stuff at the minimal cost of, of you know, just Diffie-Hellman. Uh, but we had four flows. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, suboptimal, I mean, non-optimal uh, flows. And um, we don't get minimal flows in this paper. So this is this paper. We just uh, shed off one round. Actually, because in our protocol, it's the server that starts. It is a two-flow protocol. And whether in practice the client starts or the server starts, you know, some people have strong belief about this. Mm, I think that both options are, are, are possible. Uh, but it is not one uh, round, right? And uh, we had an optimization in this paper, and we apologize, everyone, uh, that we realized is, is there is a there is a scenario that leads to an attack. So it's insecure in general, and I'll try to uh, explain uh, why, because it's like a cute uh, example of uh, well, of a mistake. Uh, and uh, but it is uh, secure in some for some applications. So I'll try to explain uh, what, what kind of applications that would be. So there is like you model this by leakage of certain form, and and uh, we believe then you are okay, but only for such applications. Just if you wanted to wonder, you know, if you if you if you move from public salting to private salt, like the strong APEC, what are the additional costs? Well, here are the additional costs. So there's different versions of uh, first of all opaque and uh, some alternatives, and um, and in particular, the first line actually gets two messages, uh, but none of them get one. Right, so so uh, at the you know except of Jutla Roy, which has significantly higher costs. Um, okay, so so let me start. Uh, like, how do we create this protocol? And actually, okay, the protocol uh, I'm going to talk about today is uh, a modification of the crypto protocol Cape. So they use similar tools. Uh, they basically one comes from the other as a, as an improvement on it. They both use something we call key hiding authentication key exchange. So here is what that is. Unlike a standard key exchange where you think of public keys as, uh, you know, everybody knows what the public keys are. Here, no. Explicitly, each party has to uh, send both their own secret key and what they think the counterparty's public key is. And there is a difference between that and the, uh, you know, standard notion of authenticated key exchange where the public keys are like reference in the sky uh, that everybody knows. Uh, because think of the uh, server as an attacker, uh, the public key and even the of the server that client assumes, and even the public key of the client that corresponds to the SKC 
the client uses. Both of these are not public. The only way to learn anything about what they are is to contribute matching pair, right? And otherwise you don't know what the other person uses, okay? And that's going to be important. Uh, why? Because uh, basically, in our protocols, both the crypto protocol CAPE and the current protocol OCAPI, um, the client doesn't have any keys. They must derive those keys from a password. So how do they derive their secret key? Well, they just hash the password, they get randomness and they get secret key. Uh, what about the public key of the server? Well, there will be an ideal cipher envelope from which they will decrypt. Uh, the, 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 what they think the public key of the server should be. Um, and the ideal cipher has, you know, has to be key hiding because uh, nobody knows, given an envelope, what the correct public pa pa password should be. Under every password, you derive different public keys. So you cannot test that way. And, uh, but it's a, it is a form of a commitment too, in the sense that for a fixed password, the public key is non-random to whoever created this envelope, because they can cr create a secret key, then public key, and then envelope. But for all other keys, the envelope is going to map to random public keys, and therefore uh, instances of whatever uh, systems that are going to be uh, secure. Uh, okay. okay, how are we? Uh, so here is... Um, Okay, uh, so why use this tool? Because actually it's a very inexpensive tool. So here are three options for how you could implement a key hiding uh, uh, authenticated key exchange. Uh, uh, triple DV Hellman. Uh, uh, the green uh, person has G2DX and G2 her secret key, SKC. The blue person has G2DY and G2 the SKS, and you do DV Hellman's, right? So this first thing is G to, you know, the green exponent and the blue exponent are always paired up. So the green party has two exponents, the permanent key and an ephemeral key. The blue party has permanent and ephemeral, and they do a bunch of DV Hellman's to, to, yeah, so they can both compute, and it both implements authentication and freshness. Uh, you can combine them all into one equation in uh, you know uh, the beautiful way that HMQV does that. And then you have the cost of effectively a single uh, DV Hellman. Uh, and then you can also do this with, generically with any CAM, right? I encrypt for you, you encrypt for me, and then one of us sends a public key, a fresh one, and you encrypt under that. And we have three nonces we derive through the key, but uh, just watch out because um, if you s think that you can do, you know, this is generic CAM, so therefore you can take a lattice CAM, there is a gap. Uh, you need key privacy in these applications, so the CAM has to be key private, and you need to have a security against a plain text checking attack. And as far as I know, uh, Plain text checking attack is like, you know, there is no efficient ways to achieve it except for basically CCA attack, CCA security. And, and then you have issues with uh, key privacy. There is actually two talks about this uh, later on, you know, uh, in the other session and yet in some other, in two sessions about uh, key privacy of CCA ver secure versions of uh, lattice encryptions. Um, Okay, uh, so so these things are inexpensive. So here is how this uh, the crypto protocol went. So as I said, uh, the client that only has a password, so she has no keys. Okay, but she can derive her secret key from how I hashing the password, and the client, the server's uh, public key, will be encrypted under an ideal cipher envelope, encrypted under the password. So that's how uh, she. And importantly, it's an ideal server over a group. Excuse me. Uh, so that was my RAM session talk, like the importance of ideal cipher over groups for these type of applications. So how do they do it? Uh, the, she derives the secret key. Uh, he supplies to her this envelope. She derives 
the service public key from that, then they run this key hiding authenticated key exchange, which as I showed on the previous slide is not expensive, and they need key confirmation messages, uh, which will uh, account for the non-optimality in round complexity of this, of this construction. Why do they need these key confirmations? Well, uh, the client to server key confirmation, why is that? Because, ah, I failed to, to point out uh, on the previous slide, these uh, cheap authenticated key exchange protocols have no forward secrecy. So uh, let me flash that because you see, why don't they have perfect forward secrecy? Because let's say I'm a blue guy. I, subs I put in G to the Y into the protocol, right? I don't have SKS. I don't have the secret key of the server. But if you look at these equations, later on, if I do get the secret key of the server, then I can complete these equations. So if the client just happily uses the key without me sending a confirmation message that proves I have the SKS at that moment, then she's subject to an attack where I corrupt the server one month afterwards and I decrypt everything that she did with that key. So it has no perfect, these things don't have perfect core secrecy. You can build perfect core secrecy by key confirmation messages, and that's why they are important here. And uh, so in particular, uh, look what happens without the client to server key confirmation message. Attacker doesn't know the password. She just puts in these ephemeral values into the authenticated key exchange. Then eventually she does offline dictionary attack, she finds the password, then eventually she derives SKS and, and PKS, she can complete these equations. It's a funny thing about an encryption that I can send a ciphertext without knowing your public key. And if a month later I learn your public key, then actually I can learn what's the CAM key that you received. Uh, most encryptions are, they, they don't commit to the public key that is used. Uh, some do, but it's like a, by, by coincidence. Most of them don't. Um, and uh, this, uh, the role of the server to client key confirmation message is that uh, if eventually the server gets corrupted, uh, again, uh, the, the adversary is going to learn the private keys that allow the completion of this key, of this authentic, you know, of the key uh, derivation equations. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, how do we improve that? Uh, in some sense, it's, it's a simple observation. We don't need to create these uh, server keys beforehand. Um, instead, we do one more hash. Uh, of course, the client derives it online. And given that hash, the server can now create a one-time secret public key pair and envelop the public key under the same, uh, under that hash. Um, so um, the, the client de decrypts under that hash now. What does this do? Two things. Because it's a one-time key, the, this key, uh, key hiding ache uh, gets cheaper because we don't need independent freshness. This one-time key is already fresh. So basically we shave off one exponent, you know, one Diffie-Hellman from these equations because you don't need ephemeral, independently ephemeral uh, key, uh, key, key stuff. Uh, secondly, uh, the key confirmation is not needed uh, from the server to client because what was the reason for it? It was that eventually you corrupt the server and you learn this permanent secret key residing on it. Now the secret keys on the server side are ephemeral, so there is nothing to corrupt. And, and um, okay, so we get basically two things, improvement in efficiency and, uh, and, and shed off around. Uh, here is, you know, quick thing like why each uh, efficiency gets better, uh, but um, it's not so, so important. Um, uh, I think this picture is kind of cute. Uh, the, here is the classic uh, protocol encrypted key exchange on the left, uh, but in a two round version. So what did Velov and Merit do at the very beginning of the whole story of cryptography and password authentication? They said, 
take a, a Diffie Hellman basically uh, or any key exchange and just encrypt under passwords. And in fact, if you do it in two rounds and only the first person has to encrypt under the password. Okay. Uh, and if you look at uh, the protocols that we have now in the Euro, you know, this OCAPI protocol I was talking about, uh, this is its instantiation with either 3D Hellman or HMQV, because they only differ by the way you derive the final key, not in messages that you exchange. And uh, you might observe that you exchange exactly the same messages as in symmetric PEG. The only difference is the way you derive the key and the fact that the key you use on the server side was, uh, you know, was, was uh, well, kept uh, for, yeah, the client's key was kept on the server. Um, you know, what kind of application would make use of this fact of this, this uh, the fact that the two very, look very much alike? Uh, okay, some sort of code minimality, maybe. And and here is why this is opaque, uh, this okapi, because this first message is the delivery of the envelope. Uh, here is the key hiding authenticated key exchange. It's really just a single message and a key derivation and a, a key confirmation. Uh, and uh, let me uh, just do one more thing, which is um, the insecure version. Uh, so this parallel between uh, this protocol and encrypted key exchange only goes so far. Uh, sort of drunk on this parallel, we propose the optimization where, where here is the, the unanimous flow. Um, no, this is the, the two round version of EKE. And here is the unanimous version, okay? Because the two messages can be created independently. So we thought, okay, maybe the same work here. Uh, and it doesn't quite, there is a scenario where uh, this, this fails. The scenario is this, uh, let's say adversary corrupts the server. So they know the hash of the password and therefore they can run as the client, except they don't have the private key little a, right? So if the adversary at the moment when he pretends to be the client to the server uh, after server compromise, so this is known as KCI attack. I attack the server and then I pretend to be the uh, one of the clients. Uh, I don't have the discrete log. Uh, I cannot complete uh, the equation, but notice that we got rid of the key confirmation. So server will, ha will you know, happily use the key, but once the uh, offline dictionary attack succeeds, uh, attacker finds the little a, completes the key derivation equation and the, all the stuff that the server did with the key uh, leaks. Uh, so it has not have, that version has no perfect power security. On the other hand, if you have an application where you use PEG to grant short-term privileges, uh, like credentials, uh, right, then access control, uh, then, then, then this kind of long-term uh, usage of the session key is not important for those applications. There, let me conclude. Uh, well, this I said all, maybe some follow-up questions. Uh, this motivates the ideal cipher on the groups, how to exactly implement it. Uh, I mean, not only this, but this in particular, um, getting, you can get lattice-based uh, asymmetric peg from lattice-based symmetric and lattice-based signatures by the GMR compiler, but using CAMS, you know, perhaps it would be nice to just do this using CAMS. Uh, and then of course, minimum cost, uh, minimum one, you know, what, what's the cost of the one round? You know, can we just do it for round, you know, unanimous, uh, a message flow. Uh, this protocol has still two message flows. Thanks. Let's thank the speakers. Do we have any questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>